Okay, so today's topic is, as I said, it's going to be we're looking at um, capacity and constraint management, and that supplement seven um, of your text. As a quick outline, um, we're going to be looking at capacity, design and effective capacity, capacity and strategy, capacity considerations, managing demand, managing capacity, man sorry, managing um, demand and capacity management in the service sector, because most of the stuff we looked at is, is, is usually manufacturing, so we're going to look at it in the service sector. We're going to look at break-even analysis, right? single product a single product case um so when you when you complete this this chapter you should be able to define capacity um determine capacity effective capacity and utilization and that's where some calculations are going to come in to be able to compute break even point so you can see that the next test is going to be heavily um into calculations right process strategy so process strategy um, the objective of our process strategy is to build a production process that meets the customer requirements and product specifications but not just um meet the customer requirement and the product specification but it must be within cost and other managerial constraints. So you're not, you, I mean, it's not like you have an open checkbook and you can just, um, you know, run up your cost um, so that you, have your, you meet your customer requirements or your product specifications. You have to do this within certain cost and managerial constraints, right? So the throughput or the number of units of a, of a facility can hold, right? receive, store, or produce in a period of time. So that's capacity, that's the definition of capacity. It's the throughput or the number of units a facility can hold, receive, or store, or produce in a period of time. So that definition covers everything. So if you're talking about manufacturing, you're producing. So it covers whatever you're producing. If you're talking about capacity of say a building, it's what you can store, it's what you can receive, it's what you can hold, right? And if you're talking about a machine also, you can talk about the throughput and that's the capacity or the number of units that it can produce, right? So that encomp encompasses um, what capacity is. So that's a good definition, right? Um, capacity will help you to determine your fixed cost, right? and determines if your demand will be satisfied. Because um, let's say you have a demand of 10,000 widgets, right? 10,000 widgets. Um, but your capacity is only 8,000, or your machine can only do 8,000 widgets. There you see, you cannot satisfy your demand because your demand is 2,000 more than what your capacity is um, for, your, for your operation. So it determines if the demand will be satisfied or not. So we usually look at three time horizons, three time horizons, right? So we usually look at long range, intermediate range, and short range, right? And um, if you if you look at this diagram that we have, we're looking at the, the long to the short to long range, and then we're looking at the options for adjusting capacity, right? Um, here we have the modi mo modify your capacity and here we have use your capacity or use capacity. All right. So we said if for a short range, right, for short range planning, you usually look at the schedule of jobs. So it's an everyday thing. You're scheduling your job, you schedule your personnel, and you allocate your machinery. That's for short um, term planning. So you do that in a factory or in a service industry. If you're talking about your short range um, planning, if you look at intermediate range planning now, right, you're looking at possibly um, adding on extra shifts, adding on extra equipment, or even subcontracting in the short term, right? Um, in the, in the, in the, if you want to look at the, the, the longer term, right, you're looking at adding on, hiring more personnel to actually do the job, or you can build or use the inventory that you have, right? 
if you want to add personnel rather than probably subcontracting because you, you don't want to subcontract forever or for too long because some contracting is usually going to cost you more sometimes it's best if you add the personnel right use up capacity that you have right let me go back to that sorry but long range long range planning now you're going to add facilities so you're going to build a facility you're going to buy a facility you're going to you're going to lease a facility for a long term, a 99 year lease, that kind of thing, right? Um, and this, this means you're, you're, you have long lead time, so you're planning for the long term, all right? So that's what that is. So you see the asterisk here tells you difficult to adjust capacity as limited options exist. Um, I will take that out. But yeah, you need to add a facility to make sure you can meet your expected demand in the long term all right so that's your planning over a time horizon <clears throat> so let's get into some of the calculations that we're going to be looking at so demand capacity is the maximum theoretical output of a system demand capacity the maximum theoretical output of a system. So your, I don't know, your machine can have a design capacity, but chances are you'll never have a hit that the, um, demand capacity. I'm gonna go into the textbook because I think they've done a very good job in terms of how they've defined everything there. Um, and since you'll be studying a lot on the textbook, I, I'm gonna also switch over to the textbook. So it's normally expressed as a rate, right? So a per day, a per month, per second, per week, that kind of thing, is normally expressed as a rate, right? And your effective capacity is the capacity that the firm expects to achieve um, given the current operating constraints, right? So you might have to do a changeover, that kind of thing, you know, change a shift, all that kind of stuff. And it's often lower, but most times it's gonna be lower than your design capacity. Since it makes sense, your design capacity is the maximum theoretical output. So your effective capacity must be lower than your design capacity. Make sense? Yeah? All right, so utilization and efficiency. Utilization is the percentage of the design capacity that is achieved. Utilization is the actual output divided by the design capacity. Right? And you guys who have done decision science, you know, we look at utilization, we look at the security theory, that kind of thing, lambda over mu. Um, but here, utilization is your actual output over your design capacity. And efficiency is a percentage of effective capacity that is achieved. Efficiency is the percentage of effective capacity that is achieved. And there's an equation for your efficiency. Your efficiency is equal to your actual output divided by your effective capacity. Right? So once you found your effective capacity and you know your actual output, you can find your efficiency. Okay? So those are equations to know. Um, before we go into this example, let me just go to the text. And this one. All right, so here's what the text has to say about what we just talked about a while ago, the design and effective capacity. So as we said earlier, your design capacity is the maximum theoretical output of a system in a given period under ideal conditions. It is normally expressed as a rate, as we said earlier, such as a number of tons of steel that can be produced per week, per month, per year. For many companies, measuring capacity can be straightforward. It is the maximum number of units the company is capable of producing in a specific time. However, for some organizations, determining capacity can be more difficult. 
capacity can be measured in terms of beds, in terms of a hospital, active members, in terms of a church, uh, billable hours, uh, CPA, certified um, chartered accountant firm, right? Um, other organizations use total work time available to measure the overall capacity. So most organizations operate their facility at a rate less than the design capacity, as we said. Any other capacity you talk about must be less than your design capacity because your design capacity is the maximum capacity. And they do so because <clears throat> they have found that they can operate more efficiently <clears throat> when their resources are not stretched to the limit. For example, Ian's Bistro has tables set with two to four chair seating, um, a total of 270 guests. But the tables are never filled that way. Some tables have one or three guests. Tables can be pulled together for parties of six or eight. There are always unused chairs. Design capacity is 270, but the effective capacity is often closer to 220, which is a 81% of design capacity. I think that's straightforward. I miss anybody else. Right? Now your effective capacity, right? Your effective capacity is the capacity a firm expects to achieve given the current operation. Sorry, given the current operating constraints. Effective capacity is lower than design capacity because the facility may have been designed for an, uh, an earlier version of the product or a different product mix than is currently being produced. Um, table, the table 7.1 further illustrates the relationship between design capacity, effective capacity, and actual output, right? So let's, let's look at this. All right, so ideal conditions exist. Here it is saying, um, Definition for design capacity. We said it was ideal conditions exist in the time system is available. And we said, here so giving you an example. If if machine at if machines at free to lay, the potato chips company, are designed to produce 1,000 bags of chips per hour, and the plant operates 16 hours per day, what is the design capacity? Design capacity is going to be equal to 1,000 bag, bags per hour times 16 hours, which is 16,000 bags per day. So that's your design capacity, right? right? Your design capacity per day. Remember, see, so they were telling you what the design capacity was per hour. And all they're saying is that they're working 16 hours a day. So what is what is the design capacity that they're expecting per day? 16,000, because it's 1,000 bags per hour, and they're working 16 hours. That's straightforward, right? Effective capacity. Um, so here we go. We said um, design capacity minus the loss because of planned resource unavailability. Example, preventative maintenance, machine setup, changeovers, changes in product mix, et cetera, or schedule and schedule breaks. So let's look at the example. So if Frito-Lay loses three hours of output every day, namely 0.5 or half an hour per day, on preventative maintenance plus one hour per day on employee breaks and 1.5 hours per day setting up machines for different products. So, you know, change over. I think I've told you guys about um, Cadbury's, you know, make different types of chocolate. You're probably running it on the same line. So, um, you might want to say you start in the morning at seven o'clock and you're running dairy milk. You might want to change that over to a fruit and nut bar. Right, so it takes time to stop, change over, change them. What's called the molds, which is where the chocolate goes in, and then it cools that, and then it knocks it out, and so you get your chocolate bars. So you might want to change the molds, that kind of thing. So that's your um, setup, basically, for a different machines. So, anyways, the effective capacity here is equal to sixteen thousand bags per day, which is your design capacity. But now you're subtracting, right? You're subtracting any um, planned planned delays um, in terms of the time and how much you would lose. So they're losing three hours a day. So then you're 16,000 bags per day minus 1,000 bags per hour 
times three hours, that's 3,000 bags they're going to lose per day, right? So then their effective capacity is 16,000 bags per day minus the 3,000 bags per day, giving them 13,000 bags per day. That's clear enough, right? That's your effective capacity. So your actual output, your actual output um, basically is your effective capacity. Watch this now, your effective capacity, right? Minus your loss of output due to unplanned. So it depends um, where you're losing time, right? So effective capacity is when you're losing time because you've planned to lose that time. You talk about your changeover, you talk about um, bricks, that kind of stuff, preventative maintenance, right? Whereas no effective capacity, right? You're talking about, um, sorry, your effect, your actual output will be your effective capacity minus your lost output during, during unplanned um, resource idleness. So we're talking about absenteeism, machine breakdown, um, unavailable parts. If you want to repair something, you can repair it uh, and quality problems. So on average, if machines at Fritale are not running one hour per day due to late parts and machine breakdown, then your actual output um, is just the 13 bags per day minus um, the 1,000 bags per hour that you normally would have done times the one hour that you've lost, which is 1,000 bags per day. So your actual output will be 12,000 bags per day. And, and, that's, and that's, that's straightforward, that was straightforward, okay? All right, so now we look at utilization and efficiency. So utilization is the actual output as a percentage of design capacity, as we said earlier. Right? So two measures of system performance are particularly useful, utilization and efficiency. Utilization is, utilization is simply the percentage of design capacity actually achieved. Right, so you need to know that utilization um, takes into consideration your design capacity. So if, and efficiency now is the percentage of your effective capacity that is actually achieved. So your utilization and your efficiency are both actually um, things that are actually achieved. Utilization looks at your percentage of your design capacity, right? And your efficiency, um, uh, it looks at the percentage of your effective capacity that you actually achieve, all right? So depending on how facilities are used and managed, um, it may be difficult to or impossible to reach 100% efficiency, yeah? Operations managers tend to evaluate, to be evaluated on efficiency. The key to improving efficiency is often found in correcting quality problems and in effective scheduling, training, and maintenance. Um, utilization and efficiency are computed below. So these are the equations you need to be familiar with. Utilization is equal to actual output over design capacity, and efficiency is equal to actual output over effective capacity. All right. Let's look at an example. At an example here. Everybody okay so far? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. All right, so Sarah James Bakery has a plan for producing deluxe breakfast rolls, right? And wants to better understand its capability. Last week, the facility produced 148,000 rolls, right? The effective capacity is 175 rolls, right? The production line operates seven days per week with three eight-hour shifts per day. The line was designed to process the nut-filled cinnamon-flavored deluxe roll at a rate of 1,200 per hour as the design was designed for 1,200 per hour. 
determine the design capacity, utilization, and efficiency of this plant when producing the lux rolls. All right, so the approach I say is first you compute the design capacity and then use equations um, uh, in table 7.1 to determine utilization and equation 7.2 to determine efficiency. We just looked at the two equations actually. So your design capacity then, right, is gonna be equal and you know they're doing seven days per week, three shifts a day, eight hours a day, right? You guys see how we get this? They tell you, seven days per week, it's three eight hour shifts per day. So there you go, seven days, three shifts, eight hours, right? Remember it was designed to do 1,800 per hour. So what's the design capacity? Times, so you, you get the total number of hours that you're running for that particular week, right? So it's gonna be 1,200 rows per hour times seven times three times eight, right? That would be a number of rows. That's your design capacity for that week, right? Your utilization now is your actual output divided by your design capacity. Your actual output divided by your design capacity. Now you're probably gonna ask, so why did you do it per week? because you're trying to get that utilization and they've given you utilization. I mean, well, you know the equation is actual output over design capacity. They've given you the design capacity, right? Sorry, you're given the output of 148 rows for the week. It says last week, see it? Last week facility produced 148 rows. So you're given that, so you're just bringing your design capacity because you know the equation is actual output over design capacity. You can calculate your design capacity in terms of rolls per week because you know how many hours and how many shifts they're working. So that's why you did it. So I know nobody asked, but so I'll let you know, right? So your utilization is equal to your actual output divided by your design capacity, which is 148,000 rolls divided by 210 which you just calculated, 200, sorry, 201,600 rolls per week. So your utilization is 73.4%. Everybody get that? Yeah. In terms of your efficiency, just revert to your equation where your efficiency is equal to your actual output over your effective capacity, right? Now, your actual output, right, was 148 rows for that week. And so your effective capacity though, it tells you, the, it gave you the effective capacity. The effective capacity is 175 rows, right? You can basically assume that we're talking about per week. So your, effective, your efficiency is actual output over effective capacity, which is 148, 148 is here, divide by 175, which you're given as your effective capacity. So your efficiency is simply 148,000 over 175,000, which is 84.6%. Clear enough? Yeah, should be. Yes, sir. Right. Sir. All right. Sir. Yes, just, go ahead. Just a question. So when we're doing the utilization and efficiency, we should work it out as a percentage. At all yeah, it's as a percentage. Okay. Both of them are as percentages, right? They're as percentages, yes. All right, because this would have been um, 0.734. So you just convert it to a percentage. So yes, convert it to percentage. All right. Uh, let's see. That's main one I wanted to get at. I think there's another one that we're going to look at, but when it comes, we will, we will look at it. Uh, hopefully I can find it, stop share. Let's get back to our slides. All right, so here we go now. Oh, this is the same one with the baker. So good, we've gone, we've gone through that. We have gone through that, beautiful. 
and everybody understands. Gonna expect one of these on your um your next test, okay? Oh, what we also worked out here was expected output. Um, given your efficient your efficiency of of seventy five percent, so your expected output is equal to your effective capacity times your efficiency. That's that's another equation, right? The effective capacity is 175 toes. They gave you that in the problem, right? There, times your efficiency. Efficiency of our new line is 75%. So your expected output will be um, your effective capacity, 175,000 times um, your efficiency. In this case, now you see you bring your efficiency back to a decimal, all right? Bring your efficiency back to a decimal when you're calculating back your expected output. You got your 75%, then you bring it back to uh, uh, my decimal. So expected output will be 131,250 rolls. So capacity decisions impact pretty much all the decisions of operations management, as well as other functional areas of the organization. Right, so capacity decisions must be integrated into the organization's mission. Right, let me go back. Let me go back a bit. Uh, give, me, give me a second. All right, so capacity decision must be integrated into the organization's mission and strategy. Right, it's pointless to you to have a mission to say and a strategy to say you want to be the, the, the leading the leading manufacturer in say chocolate when you know that you're competing against Hershey's and Hershey's has a capacity of say 10 million bars per I don't know per month, right? And you need to know what your capacity is in order to make your plans, whether you're going to invest in a new facility, invest in employing new employees, invest in new technology. So you must, um, you must know what your capacity is in order for you to set up your mission and your, your strategy. Remember now, your, your mission is your goal and your strategy is how to get to that goal, right? So special considerations for good capacity decisions. So you need to forecast your demand accurately. It's always good to forecast your demand accurately or as accurately as you can. You need to understand the technology and your capacity increments. You know, you, you, know, you can increase your production by I say 10,000 every week to get up to, 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 to where you want to get to. You need to understand the technology and the capacity increments. Uh, you need to find the optimum. Sorry. Okay. You need to find, sorry, you, you need to find the optimum operating level, right? Remember now, optimum is not always maximum. You guys are aware of that? Optimum is not always maximum. I think we read a little bit about that earlier, right? Optimum is maybe optimum is basically your best operating volume in terms of your cost um, and in terms of your profit. But your maximum now, you could be operating, you could be producing 10,000 widgets, but it's costing you much more, right? So your profit is not where it should be. Whereas your optimum level, you might be producing only 8,000 widgets, 
but it's costing you much less in terms of your energy costs, your utility costs, your labor costs, that kind of thing. Because to make to your maximum, you might be putting on overtime where you're paying staff time and a half and all of that. But your optimum now is at a level that you're maximizing your profit, so to speak. All right, you guys understand that? Yes, no, I could go over it. Sure, go over it one more time. All right, what I'm saying is there's a difference between your maximum operating level and your optimum operating level. Your optimum is your, is your best level of operation in terms of, say, getting uh, the best profit that you can. Let's just say you're making 10,000 widgets and it costs you, um, I don't know, um, let's put in, put in a, it costs you $1,000 then to make those 10,000 widgets. But let's say you can make 8,000 widgets, but it's only going to cost you $300. You don't want to move to that maximum level when it's going to cost you so much money. It's better to run it at 8,000 widgets where it's going to cost you much less. And I'm just putting in an arbitrary number here. I'm saying $300. So your profit, you're making much more profit than you would if you were producing at your maximum level. Get it? Yes, sir. Okay. Also, you should also build for capacity change. You also build for change. So you never know. You might want to, if you're building a plant, you should always think about building to increase your capacity. Right? So you give yourself some excess capacity. So if you're building a factory, basically, and you have all your equipment lined up, you want to give yourself a little wiggle room just in case something comes up and you have to add another piece of equipment or add another service, so to speak. So you always build for change, all right? Always build for change. Don't build for the exact um, demand that you have now because your demand can increase over time, right? So you need to make sure you build for change, all right? Rather than managing capacity, managers may manage demand as follows, right? And this is always an important slide. Rather than managing your capacity, you can manage your demand, right? And these are some other ways to manage your demand. So when your demand exceeds your capacity, when your demand for your product exceeds what you can produce, right? Or your capacity, you need to curtail your demand by rising prices. You understand that? If something costs $10, right? And a lot of people are buying it up, so your demand is, as, is moving. Well, you can reduce your demand, right? By raising your price. Because persons are gonna try and move to the next available product. Hopefully have equal quality with lower price, right? So to cut or reduce your demand, you can raise prices, okay? You can schedule you can schedule longer lead time rather than telling somebody they can get something tomorrow right maybe they have to get it next week right so the long-term solution though the long-term solution once you're in business is to increase your capacity right long-term solution is to increase your capacity so um, capacity, what's what happens when your capacity now exceeds your demand? Your capacity exceeds your demand. You can stimulate the market, right? To let them start buying up your product. And you know, you guys know to do that. Stimulate the market, you, um, you start promoting your product, you go on your social media, that kind of stuff, and you stimulate the market, right? Different, different ways of stimulating the market and marketers um, are good at stimulating the market. Uh, you can change your product, right? Um, of different products because you can make so much stuff, your, 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 your capacity, you can make much more than what the market is asking for. So put on a different kind of product or different product line, right? Um, let's say I'm going back to the example of um, making chocolate. Let's say you're making fruit and nut and dairy chocolate, right? Right? But you have so much excess capacity. What you can do, you can probably put on another line, put on a line with um, coconut um, filled chocolate. 
macaroons or whatever they're called, right? Um, and so you've now added um, a different product because you have the capacity that you can do that, right? Let's now look at adjusting um, to seasonal demands. Um, produce products with complementary demand patterns. Complementary demand patterns. I think there's one in here with that. Um, complementary demand patterns. Uh, I just want to check on some. Just want to check on if it's here. If it's, in another. Uh, it's not. All right, let me, let me go back. All right, we will come back to complementary. Um, and I'll get to it and explain it when I when I get to it. Um, okay. Okay, tactics for matching capacity to demand more, right? You can change your staffing, change your staffing, right? You can cut down on your staffing, right? Because your demand isn't there anymore. So you can cut down on your staffing, right? You can adjust your equipment. You can purchase additional equipment. If your demand is so high, you can um, add, purchase additional equipment. Oh, by the way, making staff changes, you can also add staff to eh? If your demand is so high, then you can add some staff um, to your organization, right? To help you to produce more, to make up, to catch up to your demand. Um, you can sell or lease out existing equipment. Let's just say you have excess capacity in your factory. Why not cord on off a piece of it and lease out that part? I've seen that happen. But I mean, as a manufacturing company downtown and the business went down and he basically rented out a part of, a part of the, the, um, the factory, right? Because the demand for his product wasn't there, but he still needs to, need, needs to exist. He still needs to survive. So basically just leased out a part of, of, um, of the factory. It was 6,000 square foot and didn't need that anymore. Okay? So improving processes to increase your throughput. So of course you can improve your process. Um, and you looked at ways in terms of which you can cut out fat, um, that kind of thing. Last class, I think we looked at some methods for doing that, analyzing the process and see where you can increase your throughput, right? You can redesign your products to facilitate more throughput, right? Redesign your products, facilitate more throughput, meaning you're producing more um, per unit time, right? Your throughput. You can add process flexibility to meet changing product preferences. So if you always produce, let's say you always produce, what I call those big back TVs, right? Nobody uses them anymore. You need to be more flexible and make those LCD TVs because that's what everybody wants, those flat screen and liquid crystal TVs, right? So you need to add process flexibility to meet the changing product preferences. Um, I remember one time, I remember the first computer I had, uh, it was a heavy, huge, Computer, portable computer. I wouldn't even call it. A, it wasn't even a laptop. It was a, I say, a portable computer, right? <laughs> and now everybody's into laptops. If you're not, if you're not using a laptop, you're, you're a joke. And if your laptop is too heavy, um, people laugh at you, right? Or if it's too big, no, you know. So you have to add process flexibility to meet changing product preferences, and that would always happen. Preferences will always change over time. And the last one, I mean, is not a nice one is closing your facility. Ha always a hard decision to make, closing your facility. But it's a decision that perhaps has to be made at some point in time. You know, if your demand is just not there for your, your product. Huh? So let's look at demand and capacity management in the service sector. Right, because a lot of exams you were giving were in manufacturing sector. Let's look at in the service sector. Look at demand management, um, how do you control that? Um, you can set appointments and reservations. That way you can control your demand, right? So everybody doesn't come to your restaurant at the same time because you've set up appointments and reservations, right? So you control and manage your demand that way. Everybody understands that? You can set reservations at your restaurant. So set appointments if you're talking about a, a dentist or a clinic. You set appointments, 
so that that way you control your demand for your service. Um, your capacity management, um, you can hire full-time staff, temporary staff, or part-time staff. That's up to you in terms of managing your capacity, right? Because if you put on more staff, then at least you can, you, you're increasing your capacity to do more service, more persons, right? All right, break-even analysis. So we always, always, always bring in calculations on break-even analysis, so let you know. Um, break-even analysis is a technique for, eva for evaluating process and equipment alternatives. So, I mean, we use this for different things, but here we're gonna be using it for evaluating the process and equipment alternatives. So the objective is to find a point in dollars and units, it's not just dollars, but dollars and units, which cost um, equals revenue. That's your break-even point, where your cost is equal to your revenue. You guys knew that, right? From another course somewhere? Yes, no, tell me. Yes, sir. Oh, good, good. So it requires estimation of your fixed costs, your variable costs, and your revenue, right? All right, so your fixed costs are the costs that continue even if no units are produced. And we looked at some of this last week also, right? Um, so some of your fixed costs are your depreciation, your taxes, your debts that you have to pay every month on your, on your, on your loan that you took from the bank, uh, on your mortgage payments. Those are your fixed costs. Now your variable costs are costs that vary with the volume of units you produce. So it varies with the number of units that you produce. So if you produce 10 units, then you expect your variable costs um, to be at a certain point. And when you produce 15 units, then you expect your variable costs to also move. Um, I was, we showed a graph last week of variable costs and fixed costs, where your fixed cost is a horizontal line, where your variable cost is increasing over time, yeah? Or over the number of volumes that you're producing. So your variable costs include your labor costs, material costs, and some portions of your utility, but that's always tough to apportion your utilities, right? In terms of your variable costs. Um, the contribution is the difference between the selling price and the variable and the variable costs. We'll, we'll come to that and show you. Uh, so some assumptions are made. You're gonna have to assume that your cost and your revenue are linear functions. So they're straight line basically, right? So if one go up, the other one goes up. And generally, generally, that's not the case in the real world, and we know that. Now, we actually know these costs um, are very difficult to verify, and there's time value of money is ignored in these assumptions, right? Well, the assumption is that you ignore time value for money. Um, time value for money, we're talking about inflation over time, all of that kind of stuff. So we're, we're ignoring that. Right, the time value for money, net present value, and that kind of stuff. And you guys have done net present value in our course, just checking. Yes, One. sir. Good. Right, so you know about the time value for money, then good. All right, so we're back to this graph again. Remember this graph we looked at last week? Some persons are gonna say they've seen this for the first time and all of that, right? Boy, anyhow, let me see if there's anything else that's going up on the graph, right? Let me just, right, okay, let me go back up. All right, so um, here you have your fixed costs at $200 and it's fixed. So no matter how many units you produce, see, volume or units produced, you produce 100 units, the fixed cost is $200. You produce 1,000 units, the fixed cost is still, going to be a thousand now. So no matter how many units you produce, your mortgage is going to be the same. That's basically what that is saying to make it easily understandable. But if you produce 100 widgets, your fixed cost will be say 250. I mean, your variable cost will say 250. But look what happens if you produce a thousand units, right? Your fixed cost is gone all the way up to almost 750. So there it goes up, right? as the number of units produced goes up. All right, so that's your variable cost. Now, 
basically what this is showing you is your loss corridor and your profit corridor because now what you're bringing in is your cost your cost line was there now you're bringing in your sorry your revenue line right your revenue right so you see what happens as your as your as you produce more units your revenues go up right and at this point now i forget you guys said you did sorry at this point now where your is your break even point where your total cost is equal to your total revenue so in here is your loss corridor right and in here is your profit corridor. And we're up here now, you start making profit, right? Because you broke even right here. Now you start making profit anywhere in here is profit, all right? So these are the formulas now that you need to know. Let's check, see. Oops. What did I do? Break even dollars. All right. So your break even, right? Break even point in units, right? Is um, BP of X, and your break even point in dollars is BP subscript dollars, right? Your P is the price per unit after all discounts. Your X is the number of units produced. Your TR is the total revenue, which is equal to um, P times X, right? Which is the price per unit times the number of units produced. That must be a total revenue, right? And your fixed cost is F. The variable cost per unit, and the variable cost per unit um, is V, and your total cost is equal to your fixed cost plus your, your total variable cost, because this is total variable cost number. This is variable cost per unit times the number of units that you produce, right? So your break-even point, all you need to know is your break-even point in terms of the number of units is F over P minus V. So it's your fixed fix cost over your price per unit, right? Minus your variable cost per unit, okay? To know that, a snapshot of that, okay? So your break-even point now in terms of dollars, right? In terms of dollars, so it's your costs and your revenue, where both of them are, is going to be a fixed, fixed cost, right? Over one minus your variable cost per unit, divide by your price per unit, all right? I did tell you there's a lot of calculations that we're going to be doing where this one's where this the last chapter and this chapter is concerned, right? Oops. Oh, right. So your profit is your price per unit minus the variable cost per unit times the number of units you produce, right? Um gosh. minus your fixed costs. But most importantly, your break-even point in dollars, all right? All right, this says, this is an example, given the information shown in the slide below, determine the break-even point in units and in dollars. So, sorry. So we're saying the fixed cost is 10,000. The direct labor cost is $1.50 per unit. Material cost is $75 per unit. Your selling price is $4 per unit. Your break even point then in dollars is going to be a fixed cost, $1,000, divide by um, one, one minus. Um, your uh, labor cost per unit plus your material cost per unit. So that's give you a total um, cost divide by your four dollars per unit, right? Which, which is your um, 
price per unit, right? So it's 150 plus 175, okay, that's your variable cost, your direct labor cost plus your material cost. So that will give you your variable cost. That will give you your V, your capital V here. So you have a direct labor cost and you have material cost. So those are your variable costs. Because as the number of units increase, the amount of material you're going to use is going to increase. As the number of units increase, you might you have to put on more persons, basically. So that's why that's your big V. It's the 150 plus the 75. All right? Everybody see that? That's your variable cost. Divide by your, your um, price per unit for each unit. All right? Which is the $4. Tells you a selling price is $4. So that would give you... 22,875 and 14 cents. Now your break even point in terms of number of units now is just F over P minus V, which is the 10,000, which is the fixed, fixed cost, divided by the cost per unit. The selling price is $4 minus 150 plus the 75.75, which is a variable cost. Okay, anybody not see this? Yeah, okay. Forget you guys do this already. I'm here laboring like crazy. All right. So look at break even example here. So you guys are gonna have to know how to calculate the break even point. Um so fixed costs are ten thousand. That's what you're given in the problem before. Okay. This is your revenue line. It's your total cost there. Sorry, guys. Um, so um, you can tell when you make, when you, let's try and see if I can get a calculation on this for you guys. Make it easier to understand. Let me back up a little bit. Calculator, calculator, calculator. Let me pause this for a second. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can calculate your break even points for dollars as well as units. All right. And that's just a graph showing you, depicting it in terms of um, graphically, basically. So to get your break even point is where your, your, um, your revenue, total revenue, meets or intersects your total costs. Okay, approaches to capacity expansion. A, you have a capacity leading strategy or B, a capacity lagging strategy. And C, you're basically just strag straddling. Um, so you have a straddling um, strategy. So, um, reducing risk with incremental changes. So here you are, we're talking about the, the leading um, versus the straddling, right? So here, let's just say this is year one, year two, year three, um, you, you, and this is your expected demand curve, right? Expected demand curve. So what it is, let's say year one, your, your demand is in this line. So you would have produced for here, but you, you didn't just stop at this line. You, 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 you gave yourself excess capacity, right? You, you made excess, you understand? This is your demand curve here, right? And this is say year one, right? And this is what you did, whoops. Yeah. This is what you did in terms of your demand. You, you, you rose your demand above what your demand, expect, your de expected demand was. So you're leading. Remember, you said it was always been an excess capacity. So you're leading here. You're leading your demand. So but what happens is in year two, your demand catches up with you in terms of your capacity. So what you do again, you build up some excess capacity, again, new capacity here. And then for year three, let's say, your, your expected demand catches up with you again, right? So that's what this is. In terms of lagging now, your capacity, what you, you see your expected demand curve, all you did, was you just you just built you just built enough capacity to meet your demand here, and what happens is, but your demand keeps going up, right? But your capacity was only here, 
So this is where you'll be losing out because you can't fill the demand here because you only build up capacity to this point. So by year two, you're way behind. And then what you do in year two, you build up some capacity, but you only build it up to meet your, your demand, right? And you keep lagging behind. That's what the lagging is, all right? And here, um, what it is, is you're looking at trying to get an average get an average capacity with incremental expansion. So for year one, you built up, for year one, you built up your capacity, right? You built it up a little bit past your demand curve, right? But you didn't go all the way up like here. You went halfway there because of maybe cost concerns and all of that, right? But what happened? You then, then you started lagging, right? But then you say, all right, six months into the year, you say, well, I, you know, that's it. Come 12 months, then I will build up capacity. And you did that, boom. And you, you didn't build it like you did it here. What you did, you went halfway there. And again, your demand exceeded your capacity. And then you lagged behind for maybe a six month period. And then when the year ended, you built up capacity again. So that's what it is where you're just straddling, right? As opposed to leading here. Okay. Everybody see that, by the way? Assuming it did. All right, so I just went through that a while ago with you, but this is making it much bigger, but that's just, just exactly what I went through. Yep. Yep. All right, so in terms of um, a study guide for what you need to do, you need to be able to compute design capacity, effective capacity, utilization and efficiency you need to thoroughly understand and implement considerations to making good capacity decisions, which, which we went through, right? Um, yeah, and that is it for today. So we had a, a kind of shortened, shortened class today, but we'll be good.